Hello, and welcome to Cross Community Church. My name is Melanie, and I'd like to welcome you to our online service. Whether this is your first time with us or you're here with us regularly, we truly are glad that you're joining us today. Our vision at Cross Community Church is to help people believe in Christ, belong to a church, and become disciples of Christ. We believe spiritual growth happens in three ways. First, we grow up by having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Second, we grow together through fellowship with other believers. And finally, we grow out by sharing the gospel throughout our community and around the world. If you're looking for a church family, CCC is a safe and great place to call home. Now, before we hear from our senior pastor, Randy Eaton, let's worship our Lord together. Good morning. Stand with us today. Let's clap our hands and praise the Lord for His grace and for His faithfulness in our lives.
worship you, Jesus. What has Jesus done for you? Has he saved you? Has he provided for you? He is good. Are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all it's stealing. Are you desperate for some healing? Let me tell you about my Jesus. One 
coming again. He is coming again. We just sang a new song this morning, My Jesus. I, those words have been ringing in my heart all week long, mainly the words, he can do for you what he's done for me. He has done so much for me, so much that I could stand here for a week and tell you all the great things that he's done in my life. Yes, there have been hard times, but he was always there with me. And when I look back, I can see everything he was doing. If you're in a hard time right now, trust me, he can do for you what he's done for me. I promise you that. Praise God. Well, now's the time that we invite you to step out of your seats and tell somebody else about your Jesus. Tell them what he's done for you and greet them in the name of the Lord. It's good to fellowship in the house of the Lord. Amen. My name is Cody and I want to welcome you to Cross Community Church. If you are joining us for the first time, please take a moment and fill out an in touch card, which you can find in the seat pocket in front of you. You can hold on to that and drop it off at the welcome desk when, um, after service, and they have a free gift for you. Giving is an important part of our worship, and if you have brought your tithe and offering with you this morning, you can drop it off in the offering baskets that our ushers will be holding as you exit. And if you are joining us online and you'd like to give electronically, you can do so in two ways. One is to go to our website, crosscommunity.cc, and click on the Give tab. Another is to find us on Venmo at Cross Community Church. If you are interested in learning more about Cross Community Church or becoming a member, we offer a six-week class called Starting Point, and this will begin next Sunday. August the 29th at 9 a.m. You must pre-register to participate, so please call the church office or email Dina so class material can be made available for you. And you can find that information in your bulletin. Ladies, we will be having a night of fellowship on Tuesday, September the 7th at 7 p.m. Girlfriends of Grace will meet in Carpenters Hall with guest speaker and local artist, Kathleen Denis. Child care will be available, but you must sign up for child care at the welcome desk before this event. And finally, Cross Community Mops, Mothers of Preschoolers, is starting up this Wednesday. It's not too late to sign up. Our very own Lauren Yanger is directing this year, and she would love to have you. Yay, Lauren! <laughs> We have been praying for Lauren as she takes on this new responsibility and she has faced with a childcare shortage and she wanted to share that God has met that need for childcare workers and that they've even had to start turning people away because they had too many. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God for providing. Those are all of our announcements. Please check your bulletin to find out more great things happening at Cross Community Church. Thank you. I want us to look at the memory verse together as we prepare our hearts for prayer. 2 Peter 3.18, say this with me, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be all glory, both now and to the day of eternity, amen. I normally do not do this portion of the service, but it is appropriate that I do so this morning because of the things that are facing so many in our congregation. And to begin with, if you haven't learned the news yet, um, with the permission of the family, I share and announce with you that Bill Freeman left us yesterday morning and is now in the presence of the Lord. Um, Linda and Elizabeth, uh, or Liz as we call her, they're here this morning. Eric, um, his son-in-law is on the drums behind us. And I think it's very appropriate that we pray for them. Um, I received the news yesterday morning and uh, spoke with Eric, and I know by now some of you have spoken with Linda. I want Linda, I want you to know we're praying for you. You are a woman of stellar faith, modeling Christ-likeness and godliness par excellent. Elizabeth, we want you to know that we're gonna honor the legacy of your father, Eric, Thank you for your faithfulness. We're gonna pray for you. Um, I don't believe the son has made it in yet from Costa Rica, uh, but we wanna remember him as well. Um, so 
Would you just bow your heads right now and pray with me? Lord, these are difficult times, but you're a rock and a refuge and ever-present help in the time of trouble. And Lord, this morning, we stand with Linda and Elizabeth and the family. And God, we, we ask you to give them grace. The fact that they're here today, God, is one of the many indications of your grace and mercy upon their life. And I thank you for this family. And I, I thank you for the testimony that Bill left us with the legacy that he has left us with. And we know that even though we are grieving, we are grieving this morning with hope because we know that Bill is with you. We do not understand, God, the unexpected turns in life. We don't understand the brevity of life. We don't understand these things, God, but we trust in you. And I pray for comfort and peace for this family. And I pray that we as a body of believers would continue to come alongside of them and serve them in any way that we possibly can. And God, I pray today that you would be pleased to bless this family with a special measure of grace and mercy. And we thank you. We thank you, God, today that Bill is with you and that when you come again, you're going to raise his body and you're going to renown it with his soul and we're going to see him again. We thank you for that promise and we thank you that he is in your hands this morning. In Christ's name, amen. I received a call this past week from Steve Arline. Steve and Lisa Arline have been a part of this church for over three decades. Lisa is a teacher of French at Benjamin. They've not been here much during COVID because of the things she's been dealing with with cancer. The cancer has come and then it has faded and come again. Dean and I, at their invitation, went to their home this past Thursday and shared communion with them. And the doctors have given Lisa six to 12 weeks to live. And we wanna continue to lift up Lisa and Steve before you. You guys know what's going on in Afghanistan. You know what's going on in our world today. You know what's going on in Haiti. There's so much upheaval. There's so much tumultuous situations going on. This morning, we were informed of a family in our congregation who are experiencing difficulties that only God can solve. And so right now, let's just pray. Let's stand to our feet and let's just begin to intercede for one another. Let's intercede for our nation. Let's intercede for our government. Let's intercede for the Christians and the churches in Afghanistan that unless the Lord acts mightily on their behalf, they have no sense of hope right now with the political uprest that's going on. So let's just pray. I want you to please pray with me. If you want to raise your hands, raise your hands. If you want to pray quietly, pray quietly. But please don't be a spectator. Let's join together and pray. Heavenly Father, I come before you right now and I lift up Steve and Lisa. God, I ask you to continue to be with them. The other day when we visited Steve and Lisa, the first thing Lisa said to me and Dina when we came in, that I am ready if the Lord wills to take me and I am ready to stay if he wills to heal me. Lord, I don't know of any other way to approach death than that way. And God, I ask you to comfort them. Lord, our families in the church are coming under attack from various elements, and I I just pray that you would strengthen the church. God, I pray that in these days of difficulties that we're experiencing, that you would give a special measure of grace and mercy to this congregation 
and to my brothers and sisters who are here today and the many who could not be here today for various reasons. We ask you to strengthen them. And God, I ask you to give grace and mercy to the Christians and to the churches that are in Kabul, Afghanistan, and that are in Haiti and that are suffering all around the world due to persecution and difficulties. God, give grace to them and give mercy and give the power of the Holy Spirit. I ask you today, Lord, to be present and let faith arise in our hearts. May we look to you. May we keep our eyes on you regardless of what we're facing or what we're going through. May you, Holy Spirit, baptize us fresh again in your love and your grace and your mercy. And we ask all of this in the strong name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God and the Son of Man, a sinner's Savior and our soon coming King. Grant it, O Lord, even now, and we will be careful to give you praise and glory and honor for you are so do it and you are worthy. May we please you in every way. And the church said amen, amen, and amen. We have an opportunity this morning to join together and to lift our voices in song and to sing and worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So I'm gonna ask you to put your hands together and give God an ovation of praise and sing with the team this morning.
trumpet sound Oh may I then in Him be found Dressed in His righteousness alone Faultless to stand before the Lord We look to you Jesus
Can we thank Jesus for his blood today? Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Lord, we look forward to the day that you come back for us. We know that we can rest assured of that day because you have told us in your word and because we are your people. We are your children. You have saved us. You have called us your own, and we thank you for that. Oh, God, your grace is amazing. Your mercy is never ending. Your faithfulness is to all generations of those who love you. So we love you today. We worship you, God. And we ask that you speak to us today through your word and through your spirit. God, fill our hearts with joy and love and peace. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated if you would like. We need Christ, don't we? We need him more today than ever before. We need him reigning in our lives. We need to know the peace of God that passeth all understanding. We need to have the confidence that he is in control. And he is in control. Can I get a witness this morning? He holds our lives in the palm of his hands. He commands our destiny. He that keepeth Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. He is a faithful God. And we need to remind ourselves of that this morning. I read recently where a Bible scholar determined that there were 366 times in the Bible that God's word says that we should not fear. So that means there is a scripture for every day of the year, including a leap year, 366. Now, sometimes we want to overanalyze and try to figure out 666. Don't worry about 666. Focus on 366. Fear not because God is good and he will keep you and he will undergird you and he will uphold you. I'm going to share a message this morning with you from Psalms chapter 11 entitled Unshakable Faith When the Foundations Are Shaken. Now don't look to me as the supreme example of someone with unshakable faith. But we're going to look at the Bible this morning because the Bible is always right. Sometimes you're wrong. Sometimes I'm wrong. But the Word of God is never wrong. It's always right. It is the supreme authority. It is what should reign over every life that exists on this earth. And one day, by the way, when Christ comes again, and he vanquishes us all evil, and he sets up his millennial kingdom, we will be with him forever and ever. The lion will lay down with the lamb, man will turn their weapons of war in, and there'll be no more pain or no more grief or no more sorrow on this earth. But until that day, we've gotta learn how to have unshakable faith when the foundations are shaken. And that is why in Psalms chapter 11, verse 3, David says something that is profound. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? He wasn't saying that God doesn't know what to do. God isn't in heaven right now forming a committee and getting advice from the angels that are worshiping before his throne. He's not pacing heaven. He's not wringing his hands. The Bible has a word for this. It's called sovereignty. It's one of God's attributes. It means that God is in complete control. He, he's all-knowing, and he's sovereign, and he's loving and gracious and merciful. And when the foundations begin to shift, and when the foundations seem to be moving and destroyed, we need to make sure that our life is built upon the foundation of God's sovereign work of grace and mercy and his unchangeable word. I was reminded of something this week. I read an article by a guy, probably you won't know him. His name is Dr. Michael Pascarelli. I hope I pronounced that name right. He's a professor of divinity at Samford University Beeson, of Divin uh, Beeson Divinity School, my alma mater. And he wrote an article on Dietrich Bonhoeffer's preaching. If you don't know anything about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I would encourage you to read everything about the man. He was a scholar, he was a theologian, but he was a pastor that served his congregation faithfully in Germany as Hitler and the Third Reich was conquering everything, or at least trying to conquer everything. 
And he read that Dietrich Bonhoeffer always called his congregation back to faith in Jesus Christ. It's something that I hope I do every week, and that is direct you to God's word and encourage you to embrace Jesus' love, to embrace his lordship, to receive him as savior, and to live your life for him and him alone, because the foundations in this world are always shaky. They're always moving around. After all, didn't Jesus say something? something about this in the Gospels when he said that if you don't build upon the foundation of Jesus Christ, then you're building on shifting sand, and shifting sand will never be able to give you a foundation upon which you ought to build your house or your life. I'm no farmer. I'm certainly not a construction engineer. I am not a contractor, but this is one thing I know. You cannot build a home. You cannot build a building. You cannot build a church. You cannot build your life. You can't build your marriage. You can't build your business. You can't build anything without a firm foundation. I remember my grandfather had chickens and hogs and cows. And I do remember that the one thing that didn't have a foundation was the chicken coop. If you want to build your life like a chicken coop, then just ignore everything that we're about to read in Scripture. But if you want to build a solid foundation, and if you want to build your life in a way that's going to outlast you, if you want to leave a legacy to the faithfulness of God, if you want to be the kind of medical doctor that honors God, or the kind of school teacher that's going to leave a legacy that outlives you, I would encourage you to listen to the words of David. This past year in 2020, a survey was given, and they examined what the major topics of preaching were in major churches in North America, and this is what they discovered. They discovered that a lot of pastors devoted their time preaching for or against COVID, preaching for or against the economy, preaching for or against politics. What a shame on those of us who occupy the sacred desk to stand before God's people and revel in ambiguity and to talk about things that have no eternal significance, no eternal value. Maybe we ought to think about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. When he wrote the book, Cost of Discipleship, he reminded his people that even in the midst of facing evil, and there has been no man more evil in the history of this world than Adolf Hitler and what the Gestapo would do and what the Third Reich wanted to do to people that wouldn't submit to their reign. And it's going on all over the world today. And we're seeing it in latent form in North America with political correctness. The question is, what are you going to do? I want to urge you this morning to make your mind up that you're going to submit your life to Jesus Christ. Receive him as Savior. You don't make him Lord. He's already Lord. I would suggest to you that you acknowledge his lordship and that you submit yourself to him. That's what Dietrich Bonhoeffer encouraged his people to do. He was always talking about Jesus Christ, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and how the only way we're going to have unshakable faith when the foundations are shaken is by placing our hope and our faith in the person of Jesus Christ. When you're reading something like Psalms chapter 11, it would be very wise to understand the historical context. The best of my understanding is, is that this was written by David, and it was written during a time when he was fleeing from King Saul. Do you know anything about King Saul? He was a man that Samuel chose. He was a man that the Bible says was head and shoulders among all the other men in Israel, which meant that he was tall and handsome. But you know, looks can be very deceiving. That's why the beauty is really within the heart and whether or not you and me and man and women are totally turned to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And he was a man that started out really good, but he didn't end well at all. And here's why. He departed from the ways of the Lord. He decided that he wasn't going to build his life upon the solid foundation of God's word. In fact, if you read anything about the Old Testament, this is what you'll know. There was this young man named David. He was a remarkable man when he was following God. In fact, David was at his best when he was seeking God, and he was at his worst when he was refusing to seek God. Do you know anything about David? I mean, here's a young man that was chosen of all the sons of Jesse. He was the one that was chosen to be the eventual king to 
ascend to the throne and to reign over Israel. But during this time in his life, he was constantly fleeing from the jealous rage of King Saul. Here was a young man who has already defeated a bear. He's already defeated a lion. He's already defeated the Philistine giant and known as Goliath. He chopped his head off with his own sword. Here was a man who knew something about warfare. But David was a unique man. He was a sensitive man. He was a man that knew how to write poetry. He was a man who knew how to play musical instruments and arrange lyrics and write songs. And so here was a man on one hand who could write songs and play music. And on the other hand, he could step into an MMA ring and defeat the prize fighter of his day, a remarkably uniquely gifted man. And it is within this context that David, who has not ascended to the throne yet, is running from King Saul. And this question comes to his mind, what are the righteous going to do when the foundations begin to crumble? Because he began to notice that Saul's foundation was crumbling and what are the righteous going to do? We're not going to run, are we? We're not going to be afraid. We're not going to live in fear. We're not going to give in to deception. We're not going to give in to delusion. We're not going to be dismayed. We're not going to allow the enemy to destroy us. What are we going to do? Psalms 11 gives us a few suggestions on what we can do. First of all, I want you to notice what we read in the first few verses. We learn in this passage of scripture how to be dependent upon God's faithfulness. Don't depend upon your own faithfulness. I was just recently discussing this with someone in the church. I know that I'm going to heaven, not because of my own righteousness, but because of the righteousness that Jesus Christ has given me. Did you know that when you place your faith in Christ, when you come to him and you say to him, I'm giving you my sins, you know what God does for you? He gives you the righteous robe of Jesus Christ and he takes your filthy garments of sin and he puts them on Jesus Christ. That's what the cross was all about. And when we accept that by faith, we learn how to depend upon God's faithfulness, even when things happen that we don't understand, even when we're living on the backside of a question mark, even when the foundations seem to be crumbling all around us. And I want you to notice what David wrote beginning in verse 1 of Psalms 11. In the Lord, I'm going to take refuge. How can you say to my soul, flee like a bird to your mountain? For behold, the wicked, they bend the bow. They have flitted their arrow to the string, and they shoot in the dark at the upright in heart. But if the foundations of the righteous, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? David is asking this question to himself. What am I going to do? Now that the foundation that Saul has as the king of Israel is crumbling, what am I going to do? Have you ever thought about that in light of where we are today? Everything seems to be crumbling in society. I want us to pause for just a moment, and I want us to read something that the Apostle Paul wrote to a young pastor named Timothy, as recorded in 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. I want you to listen to these ancient words, inspired by the Holy Spirit, written thousands of years ago to a young pastor, probably in his mid-30s, maybe early 40s. He was pastoring a group of people in the city of Ephesus, and this is what Paul wrote. But understand understand this, Timothy, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money. They're going to be prideful. They're going to be arrogant. They're going to be abusive. They're going to be disobedient to their parents. They're going to be ungrateful. They're going to be unholy. They're going to be heartless. They're going to be unpleasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power, avoid such people. 
There you go, ladies and gentlemen. You've just heard from the Word of God. It's almost as if the Apostle Paul had telescopic vision and that he could see beyond his own time there in the ancient city of Ephesus. And why is that? It is because the Holy Spirit of the living God was giving Paul a prophetic word that he was going to preserve down through the annals of history so that we today could gather once again and hear these words. Why are these words in Scripture? To remind us that God has it all under control and that when the foundations begin to crumble, we we can have unshakable faith even when everything around us seems to be shaken loose. Why is that? Because Jesus Christ reigns forevermore. I think that sometimes in the Christian church, we fail to really comprehend and understand the sovereignty of Jesus Christ. He died for us and he was buried, but he was raised from the dead. You do not serve a dead Messiah. You serve a risen Messiah. I've submitted my life to a risen Messiah. And because he was raised from the dead, I know that I'm going to be raised from the dead. Because he ascended into heaven and is at the right hand of the Father, I, along with you and every other person that knows Christ as Lord, has eternal access into the very throne room of God to receive grace and mercy. And that is why David could say, even in Psalms chapter 11 and verses 1 through 3, when the foundations begin to crumble. What can the righteous do? Well, here's what the righteous can do. We can stand up, we can straighten our backbone, and we can have hope and peace and joy because our foundation is built upon the truth of Jesus Christ. Our foundation is not built upon the shaky things that this world has to offer. I see people all the time who feel that they're secure because they have money or they have health or they have political prowess or they have some type of notoriety. We need to remember that if we have any of that in this life, it is a good gift of Almighty God. And we need to steward it specifically and for the express purpose of bringing God and God alone all the glory all the honor and all the praise. This is not a historical lesson this morning, but I just want to remind you of a couple of things. When pornography and abortion were legalized back in 73, in the late 60s, early 70s, the pornographic industry started with an annual revenue of five to $10 million a year. The foundations have become so shakable today that today, according to something I read last night, the porn industry in America alone is $100 billion. The foundations have come loose in our nation morally. Think about what we're dealing with in Afghanistan. Have you ever studied about this nation? It's, it's not much geographically. It's primarily arid and mountainous. And yet, it has caused so much trouble in the Middle East. Have you read about how in the late 1800s and the ninth, early 1900s, the sovereign, most powerful country in the world at that time, known as Great Britain, tried to handle them and they could not? Do you remember, for those of you who are old enough to do so, the Cold War and what was going on when Russia invaded Afghanistan in hopes that they could somehow limit Afghanistan's migration into their own country? If you look at the map, Afghanistan is not too far from Russia. The Mujahideen, they, they caused so much trouble for Russia that Russia had to leave in absolute humility. And then the Taliban, they stepped in at that time and they filled that gap. And it has been an ongoing problem throughout the history of the world. And don't forget about Pakistan. Pakistan and Afghanistan have a very weird relationship. Sometimes they're enemies and sometimes they're kissing cousins, but there's all kinds of upheaval and turmoil going on right now because something is going on spiritually in the world. I want you to think about what's going in the, on in the world economically. I want you to think about what's going on in the world politically. We are at a point where we're witnessing insanity. 
And the question is, why are we seeing all of this? It is because the foundations are coming off. The foundations are coming off morally. The foundations are coming off economically. The foundations are coming off financially. The, fin the, the foundations are coming off politically. The foundations are coming off philosophically and culturally and socially. And the list could go on and on and on. But here we are. What are we going to do about it? Well, we're not going to be fearful. We're not going to live on the backside of a question mark all the days of our life, wringing our hands and worrying. We're going to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might because Jesus Christ has this world in his hands. And if you have trusted him as your Lord and Savior, he has you in the palm of his hands. There is a great fallacy, brothers and sisters, that exists today in our world that everybody is God's children. That is not true. If you've not received Christ as Lord, you are an enemy of God. That's what the Bible teaches. But when you place your faith in Christ, you are adopted into the family of God. From life's first cry, the song says, until final death, he commands your destiny. You have nothing to fear when the foundations come away. When you are depending upon the faithfulness of Almighty God. But there's something else this text teaches us. It tells us that we also, in order to have this unshakable faith, we need to learn how to declare God's sovereignty. We need to speak it, not that we're speaking it into existence. I'm simply saying we need to speak what is already real and affirmed and true in the Bible. And that's what David does in this passage of Scripture. As he's musing over his situation, his, his circumstances, and he's asking the question, what can the righteous do? I want you to know what he says beginning in verse 4. Notice what the text says. The Lord is in his holy temple. Read this with me. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes see and his eyelids test the children of men. What is this text saying? It is saying two things. Don't miss this. Number one, right now, in the midst of all the chaos, God is sitting on his throne. That is, heaven is his footstool and the earth is beneath him. And every situation that we're facing in life is beneath the feet of Christ. He reigns and he rules. Have, have you ever read the book of Revelation? If you haven't, I would commend it to you. But let me give you a biblical interpretive paradigm through which to read the book of Revelation. Please don't launch into it trying to figure out what the seven seals and the seven bowls and the seven trumpets represent. Don't try to figure out everything that is written in first century language to people at that time that were separated from by thousands of years. Rather, read the book of Revelation with this overarching theme in mind. Jesus reigns and he is ruler of all history. When you and I grasp that, we can speak now even and declare that God is sovereign over every circumstance and over every situation. Linda Freeman, I don't know why the Lord allowed Bill to enter into his presence at this time in your life with all the plans that you all have had, but you know, my sister, that God in his sovereignty welcomed Bill into his eternal presence and that he is experiencing, Bill is experiencing the grace and the goodness of Jesus Christ right now in ways that we can only see through the eyes of faith. Bill's faith has now become sight. For some reason, God has allowed this to happen, but he's directing everything and he's orchestrating everything for the purpose of his glory and for our own good. If we can get past the first words in the Bible, found in Genesis 1-1, I think that we can get past every other difficulty in life. Here's what the Bible opens up with. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He is the one who has created it all. Scholars say that he created everything ex nihilo. That's a fancy Latin word, which means out of nothing. You and I can't make anything out of nothing. We can make a mess out of something, 
but we can't make anything out of nothing. And yet God made everything that we see from nothing. He spoke it into existence. That lets me know that he's not only the architecture, he's not only the designer, but he is the sustainer of everything we experience in this life and in the life to come. There was a prophet in the Old Testament. Oh, you ought to read about these men God used in the Old Testament. There was a prophet by the name of Isaiah. He's listed in the Old Testament as a major prophet. There are many major prophets and many minor prophets that had ministry in the Old Testament. He wasn't a major prophet because his message was more important than one of the minor prophets. He was a major prophet because God chose to use him to speak more than the minor prophets. And he said something in Isaiah chapter 6 verse 1 that is extremely germane to us today. He says this, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne and he was high and he was lifted up and his train filled all of the temple. I hope that we can catch this prophetic word that Isaiah gave thousands of years ago when King Uzziah, who was in control of everything, when he died, God was still alive. And he wasn't just alive, he was alive sitting upon a throne. This is an Old Testament image of the sovereignty and the supremacy of God in every situation and every circumstance. You find someone whose hope is built only in their finances or whose hope is built only on their health or whose hope is built only on tangible things that they have in this world, you will find someone who has no real hope and no real foundation because the minute those things are taken from them, they seem to lose their peace and they seem to lose their joy. But do you hear what Isaiah the prophet is saying? In the year that Uzziah died, when the political foundations came unglued, I saw the Lord. And he was high, and he was lifted up. I saw the Lord, and he was sovereign in control of all situations and all circumstances. I saw the Lord, and because I saw the Lord high and lifted up, I'm not worried whether or not King Uzziah is going to reign as he has reigned in the past. I saw the Lord, and that lets me know that everything is going to be okay, and that my faith can be firm, even though the foundations are shaken. Men and women, you know this as well as I do. Some of you have gone through situations that I can't comprehend, understand fully. I've talked to you about them, but here's one thing you know. When Christ is in your life, there is this peace that passeth all understanding. If you don't have this peace that passeth all understanding, it's because you don't have Christ reigning in your heart and life. But the good news is that God allows you turns. Can I get a witness? He, he allows people, he allows people to come to an understanding that they need him. And God may be allowing some of the foundations right now. I know everybody has a different theological view. And I'm not here to argue one view over another. I'd be happy to discuss this in a sensible setting over coffee sometime. As long as you'll buy the coffee, I'll do all the talking. I'm not interested in getting into a debate. But it's interesting to me. When you read the Bible and you read it within its context as the Word of God, that lets me know that those of us who know Christ as Savior and Lord can have a peace that passes all understanding. It's a spiritual thing, ladies and gentlemen. It, it is the fruit of the Spirit. When you and I place our faith in Christ, He seals us with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit begins to give us understanding into the Word of God. He begins to give us a unique insight into the meaning of the Word of God. And, and, and if we're lacking that, it might be because we've never acknowledged Christ as Lord and Savior. We think we're saved because we're good people. You might think you're saved because you're sitting in this church today, but you're not saved unless you have personally, by faith, turned to Christ 
and you've received his righteousness and you've given him your sins. And when you do that, the Holy Spirit comes in and he seals you and he gives you an understanding of scripture. And, and that's what David was talking about. He knew the Lord. That's what Isaiah was talking about. In the year that King Uzziah died, he saw the Lord high and lifted up. David said in verse 3 of Psalms 11, when the foundations come off and are unglued, what are the righteous going to do? They're going to turn to the Lord and they're going to trust him completely and totally. Doesn't mean you're going to be perfect all the time, does it? Doesn't mean that you're never going to make a mistake. It doesn't mean that you're never going to sin and fall short of the glory of God. But this is what it does mean. It doesn't mean you're going to be perfect, but it does mean you're going to make progress little by little, week by week, month by month, until the day comes that Christ parts the eastern skies and he comes again. Until that day comes, you and I ought to be walking by faith and you and I ought to be loving the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind, and body. You and I ought to be trusting in him and we ought to be resting in him. That is how we develop an unshakable faith when the foundations are shaken. And it will happen at some point in your life. You're going to experience moments when the foundations are shaken. We live in a superficial society. We live in a bunch of silly theology. We, we believe that if we have a flat tire, that the devil is persecuting us. And this is the truth. People believe that if they have to go get a tooth extracted, that somehow they're being oppressed by the devil. No, that's not what that is all about. That's just what happens in life. We get old and things happen. And thank God for dentists and doctors and all of those who make this life more comfortable for us. We live in this world where we think if we get pulled over for speeding and get a speeding ticket, that somehow or another we've sinned against God and he's out to get us. That's silly, that's superficial, that's shallow. If you want to know what persecution is about, read about what the brothers and sisters are going through right now in Kabul, Afghanistan. Read about that as the Taliban goes house to house, beheading and killing in a gruesome way those who want to call upon the name of Jesus Christ. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. I hope that when you leave here today, you'll see the Lord. In fact, I pray that the Holy Spirit of the living God would help this congregation see in a fresh and new way that Jesus Christ is sovereign, that he sits upon his throne, that he rules and he reigns, and he's directing everything for his good and for his glory and for our good. If we can somehow grasp this, this is what's going to happen. When the fragile foundations begin to arise in our life, our faith is going to be firm. Our faith is going to be firm because the foundation of our faith is the person of Jesus Christ. And David says this in Psalms 11, we need to depend upon God's faithfulness and we need to declare God's sovereignty and we need to dispel the myth of deception. We're living in a deceived world right now. Politicians are deceived. Boy, are they deceived. When we redefine marriage, we are deceived. Did you know that in 2015, this nation, the greatest nation on the face of the earth, the greatest nations historians say have ever existed, we, we put people into elected positions who had the audacity and the backbone to make legal in all 50 states gay marriage. We did away with DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act. We're pressing the Equality Act more than ever before, and we do nothing about studying it. People in the church don't know anything about it. Oh, we think it's some great, great Equality Act that's going to be passed and make every, no. Listen, it's not about that. It's going to bring more difficulty to religious liberties than this nation has ever known. You mark my words down on it. 
when the Equality Act becomes the law of the land, and it has already passed in one branch of the Congress, and they're trying vociferously to pass it in other branches, it will undermine religious liberty. But see, we, we have a way of accepting deception as it is the truth. And the question is, why do we accept deception? Are you ready for this? Here it is. We are deceived because we think that we can sin and get away with it. That's what we think. That's what a lot of people think in the church. They think that they can live in sin and get away with it. Now, that's what deception is. The question is, if that's what it is, how did we get here? Are you ready for this? We got here because we choose to disobey the Word of God. This is not rocket science. You don't have to be a theologian or a New Testament scholar to understand this. Just read your Bible and look around at the world today. We're living in deception, and here's what happens when we embrace deception. We become delusional. And then we are led into all kinds of destruction. And the foundations are being destroyed right before us. But do not fear. Because God says, I've got all of this under control. You serve me. You follow me. You keep your eyes on me. If God says that I'm going to tarry another 1,000 years, you know what he's going to do? He's going to be faithful to his word. He's going to continue to raise up Christians all over the world to preach and to teach and to live out the gospel of Jesus Christ. But here's what we need to do. We need to dispel the myth of deception. And I want you to notice what we read in verses 5 and 7. And I'm going to move very quickly. Here's what the text says. That the Lord tests the righteous, and his soul hates the wicked, and the ones who love violence. Let him rain coals on the wicked, fire and sulfur, and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds, and the upright will behold his face. We're such a deceived nation today that we think everything is about grace, and everything is about heaven, and everything is about blessing, and everything is about prosperity, and everything is about a new job, and a new car, and a new home, and a new spouse, and whatever new that you want in your life. All along, God is saying, I'm not going to bless sin and those who are unrepented. No, I'm going to judge it. If you don't believe in the judgment of God, then you don't understand how God has revealed himself in Scripture. He's so holy that he placed his own son on a cross. And he poured out the wrath of his judgment on Jesus. So that those of us who by faith would receive this, we would be free from the penalty of sin. Have we forgotten that the Bible teaches that the wages of sin is death? Not just death right now. If you die in your sin, you're going to not only die physically, but you're going to die spiritually and you're going to die eternally. I was reading recently in Charles Haddon Spurgeon's commentary on this passage of scripture a good definition of hell. Here's what hell is. It is the horror of hell where we will drink eternally from the cup of God's wrath without one sip of his mercy. We don't like to believe in a God who judges and that's what's wrong with most of the world today. It's why the church is beginning to embrace all of this stuff to be politically correct. Did you read what the text says? The Lord is righteous, and he's the one that's going to judge one day. Did you know that's what the great white throne judgment is all about in the book of Revelation? Those who die right now apart from Christ, they will be raised again at the end of the millennial reign, and they will stand before God to give an account for why they rejected him. And then they will enter into a Christless eternity. It is known as hell. It is the domain of the devil. It is an everlasting departure from the presence of God. So what are the righteous going to do when the foundations come unglued? We're not going to fear and we're not going to walk away from God. We're going to run to him and we're going to present the truth of God's grace and his mercy. 
I want to read something to you out of 2 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 4. For those in the world who are so deceived that they think they can live the way they want and they can thumb their nose up at God and they think they're getting away because, you know, justice is not always served on this side of heaven. I had lunch with two attorneys last week and they reminded me, Pastor, Justice on this side of eternity does not always happen in the court systems. But let me read something to you, beginning in verse 4 of 2 Peter 2. If God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but he did preserve Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual contact of the wicked, for that righteous man lived among them day by day. He was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds and he saw and he heard what they did. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. You hear the word of God this morning, brothers and sisters? God is in control. Don't let the ungodly pull you and fit you into their mold. You stay righteous, you stay holy, you stay faithful. Don't cave in, don't quit, don't give in. The unrighteous abound everywhere. One day, their fate will come. Until then, remain faithful. Trust him and serve him. Some of you this morning have probably said, what about what's going on in Afghanistan? What about what's going on in the economy? What about what's going on in Haiti? What about what's going on with the persecuted Christians in the Middle East? I've got enough trouble in my own life. My spouse is unfaithful. My health is poor. I don't know how I'm gonna pay my bills. I got good news for you this morning. God will so work in your life that he will give you an unshakable faith when the foundations in your life are shaken. And all you have to do is turn to Christ by faith and choose to follow him. And he will begin to work in your life. There may be things that you need to fix, but he will help you to fix them. Can I get a witness this morning? We don't get cleaned up and come to the Lord. We come to the Lord to get cleaned up. As we come to him in faith and repentance, he begins to work. He begins to show us things in our life. And he, his will for us is to have a strong faith and a firm, firm foundation. Amen. Will you receive the word of the Lord this morning? God is good. He's gracious. He's merciful. Turn to God. Have a firm foundation of faith in the Father rest in the sovereignty of our Savior and leave the judgment to Jesus. Walk hand in hand with the Messiah and he'll be with you. Would you just stand with me this morning and would you right where you are, lift your hands to the Lord and ask him to help you. Help me, Lord. Cry out to him. Help me, Lord. I need your help, Lord. We're living in deep and dark and depressing days, but Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough. Are you hearing me, brothers and sisters? Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough. He will meet you where you are. He will save you from your sins. He will sanctify you. He will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. He will give you power from on high. Jesus is enough. And that is your firm foundation this morning. This week, if God tarries, make it a point to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. 
He's the first and the last. He is the line of the tribe of Judah. He is the bright and he is the morning star. He is the savior of the world. He is the savior of the church. He is the savior of the world and he is the one who will meet you right where you are. So just cry out to him, Lord, thank you. Pray with me this morning, church. I'm gonna trust that the Holy Spirit can direct you to pray how you need to pray, but pray with me. Lord, we need you this morning so desperately in our life. Help us, Lord. We're about to leave this place, Lord, but we're not going to leave your presence for you are strong and mighty in battle. You are faithful to your own. Your eyes are looking out over all the earth and you know those who are faithful. David says over and over, God, in the Psalms, that when he struggled, he would look to you. That when he had doubts, he would run to you. That when he sinned, he would confess that to you. That when he was filled with joy, that he would sing to you. That he would bless the Lord at all times and that his praise would forever be on his lips. David said that he would bless you and not forget all of your benefits. God, just remind us today of the benefits that you've given us. We are your children. We belong to you. And you are faithful to us even to the end of time. We bless you and we thank you and we honor you. Now may the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Now unto him who is able to keep you from all sin and to present you before Almighty God without sin, guilt, condemnation, or fear. His name is Jesus. And to him be all glory and all honor and all praise, both now and forevermore. You can stay connected with us throughout the week on our website, crosscommunity.cc, and on our Facebook and Instagram pages. You can find us there at Cross Community Church. If you have a joy or if you have a concern that you'd like us to pray for, please do not hesitate to reach out to us by phone or by email. We are here to serve you. We love you and we are praying for you. Thank you again for being with us today and have a wonderful week.